Our scripture reading for this morning comes from uh, 1 Peter. 1 Peter, the first chapter. Um, I know the, the bulletin tells us verses 3 through 12. Um, and I really thought when I told Rebecca to type that in there that way that I would get through verse 12. But I couldn't get past uh, verse 5. So you'll just have to forgive me for that. And uh, so let's read 1 Peter, the first chapter, verses, uh, let's read verses 1 through 5. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ, and for the sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Lord, we praise you. We thank you for your word. Lord, as we come to your word, may we do so humbly with hearts that have been touched by the power of your spirit. Lord, it is only through your spirit that we can grasp or even understand the depth of meaning in your word. So, Father, we just ask that you open our hearts and our minds and our eyes to the message of your scripture. In your name we pray. Amen. I think as we begin this morning, we need to remember who this letter is written to. First Peter, who is it written to? It says, Peter, an apostle to Jesus Christ, of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles. Now, who are the elect exiles that have been scattered throughout uh, that area? Well, the word elect means chosen. In other words, Peter is writing to the chosen people of God. And Moses told the tribes of Israel, Deuteronomy 14, 2, the Lord has chosen you to be a people for his own possession. And if you read, as you read through the Old Testament, uh, we see that Israel is referred to as God's chosen possession throughout the Old Testament. And Peter, I believe, is transferring this concept to the Christian community. Peter's saying, we are God's elect. We are God's chosen people. God's church. That's who Israel is. If you look at at it in the uh, entirety of Scripture, when you look at that, we are God's people. We have been chosen here. We are the elect exiles. He's writing to the first century Christian community that's been exiled. And why have they been exiled? Because of their faith in Jesus Christ. That's why they've been pushed to the margins of society. That's why they were outcast from Jerusalem. He's writing to believers who are persecuted because of their faith in Christ and their belief in the resurrection. And the persecution of these early Christians here in the first century wasn't widespread at this time. First Peter was written, I think, around 60, 65 A.D., and so, and the, and, the, and the persecution, the widespread persecution didn't happen until later on under another emperor. And if I'm remembering my church history light, his name is uh, Domination. I can, never could say it. I can spell it for you, I, I think. But anyway, it's not a persecution that's happening throughout the whole Roman Empire at this time. It's localized. And uh, part of the persecution that was ha- happening was to blame Christians for the ills of society. And most of us have probably heard of Nero, remember Emperor Nero, and he's playing his violin as the city of Rome burns. Well, Nero blamed the Christians for setting the fire. But you can go back in church history, and there are a lot of people who said that Nero was just crazy and that he was the one who set the fire as Rome was blazing. And so... 
people thought it was the Christians because the emperor said that, and so they were pushed to the outskirts of society. They were blamed for all of the bad things that were happening because the fire burned, almost burned the entire city to the ground, and these darn Christians caused all of these problems that we're having now. Does any of this sound familiar? Amen. Okay. Aren't Christians blamed for the ills of society here in 21st century America? If you were just more open-minded and not so exclusive, then we wouldn't have all of these problems. Who is the, who is the only group of people that, are, that is uh, fair game, that is politically correct to harass, politically correct to put down? Christians. Christians are. For example, uh, Bill Maher who regularly makes fun of Christians in one of his monologues, he even uh, degraded the sacrament of Holy Communion. Can you imagine if he did something like that to Islam? He'd be in fear for his life. Then there's Howard Stern. Remember him? Everybody knows Howard Stern. He said that if he were president, he would march all the Christians, all those Degum pro-lifers, into the gas chamber and burn them to the ground because we would be better off. Without them, he said. And then there's a fellow in Idaho who was fired because he put Bible verses up in his cubicle at his office because his, um, his employer had distributed pro-homosexual flyers and he just posted a Bible verse inside of his cubicle and he was fired because he did that. Now, in the first century, First Peter was written to Christians who were persecuted for their faith and its message is one of hope in the face of persecution and trials. And we need its message today. Anybody ask if the Bible is relevant? It's hard to make it not relevant. It's hard to make it not relevant because Peter speaks to us. The Lord speaks to us. We need hope in the face of these things. Peter tells us that the elect exiles of the 21st century need hope in the face of their trials, and that we have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. And in other words, the Lord has, has saved us, He's redeemed us, and He saved us and He's redeemed us to be a part of His gracious, loving, sovereign plan. In other words, God didn't roll the dice and throw us down on this planet uh, in, in a show, as a show of chance. He sovereignly placed us here for a purpose. He has a plan, and that purpose and that plan is that we would worship him, love him, honor him, and serve him. We, we are to live our lives in that way, to worship God, to praise God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And God has a plan, and you are part of that plan. In fact, when Peter uses the word foreknowledge, in this verse it means to set one's love upon a person or persons in a personal way, in a personal way. Peter says that we are elect, that we are chosen according to this foreknowledge of God. And he means that God chose us before time even began, before there was even such a thing as time, because God is outside of time. You and I are time-bound creatures that have been saved for all of eternity. So we are stranded in this time, but we're going on into eternity, and God chose us, and he chose to love us. And what that means is, is in spite of who we are and what we might have done and what we may or may not do in the future, God loves us. God cares for us, and he chose to redeem his people through the life, death, and resurrection of his son. That's, that's the ultimate picture of God's grace, isn't it? There's, there's hope in that, isn't there? There's peace, there's comfort in this truth. To know that as, even as we wallowed in our sin without, without any hope of being redeemed, there was no way we could get ourselves up. God chose to reach down, take us by the hand, and lift us up out of the muck and mire of our sin so that we could glorify his mighty name. It's just like the psalm that we read as we began worship today. He lifted us up out of that slimy pit, out of the mud, out of the mire, and then he set our feet upon the rock, the rock of Jesus Christ, and then he put a hymn of praise to our God in our mouth, 
And the rest of that verse there, the third verse of Psalm 40, is that so that many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. In other words, you weren't saved and placed upon a rock and then forgotten about so that you could gather dust. Okay? You weren't saved to sit in a pew. You were saved to be a witness of the grace and glory of Jesus Christ. You were saved so that many could, others could be brought to Jesus Christ and place their faith and trust in Him. Are you telling people about Him? Are you telling your family about Him? Are you witnessing to them? Are you asking them to come here and hear the message of the truth so that they too might become one of the elect exiles, one of the chosen of God? You see, God has a plan. And part of that plan is that we would be his witnesses. And God has redeemed us for that plan. And he's redeemed us to give us a hope for the future and a hope so that we can face anything. Now you think about that. God has graciously chosen to love his people by sending his one and only son. God determined, Paul tells us in Ephesians 1, God determined before the foundation of the world that we should be holy that we should be blameless before him. He decided long ages ago, before time was thought of, that he would love you and me. And it's this amazing grace and love and forgiveness. It overwhelms Peter. It overwhelms Peter. And he's writing about this, that we've been redeemed. And you know what he does? He just breaks into praise. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy, He has, who has caused us to be born again through the hope of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He just says, praise the Lord. I can't help it. It's going to burst out of me. Amen. Someone has said that all sound theology begins and ends with doxology. You go, well, that's a seminary word. What's doxology? What's doxology? Well, we sang the doxology this morning. Doxology, you know, we did it. Listen to, think about the words. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. What's doxology? It's a hymn of praise. That's what the Greek word doxa means, to praise and to glorify. And when we do the doxology, sing the doxology, or live our lives to God, we are to ascribe glory to Him because he's the only one that is worthy of glory, honor, and praise. And Peter is praising God because it is God who has caused us to be born again to a living hope. And that's exactly what these first century Christians needed was a living hope. And it's exactly what 21st century Christians need. A living hope in the midst of of our trials in the midst of our persecutions of this life. And we need to remember that the word hope in the scriptures means something very different than what we think it means. Our culture uh, has a common meaning. Uh, we, when we hear the word hope, we think of uh, something subjective. I hope that this or that will happen in the future, but I'm not sure if it will happen. That's how we define hope in our culture. But biblically, hope is the absolute certainty and absolute assurance that will, God will do in the future everything that he says he will do. That's biblical hope, that God will keep his promises. And all who have placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, who have been born in, again into a hope, a living and lasting hope, a hope that is inseparably related to the resurrection, have that living and lively hope. And friends, being, uh, being born again, we haven't simply been born again so that we can have a better life in this world. We haven't been born again so that God can give us a second chance in this life. Instead, we've been born again to live a life of praise to God, and we're to do that for all eternity, and that life of praise is sustained by the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what our hope is. That's the lively hope. And I, that, I say lively hope because that's the way the King James translates it. And I like it. That we have been begotten, uh, uh, that God has begotten us again to a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And that's what we need. We need a lively hope. A hope that's established upon the resurrection of Christ. Because if our hope isn't founded upon the resurrection of Christ, we have no hope at all. 
We have no hope at all. Paul writes about that in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. And again, I like the King James. We are of all people to most miserable. Miserable. We must remember this. Before we knew Christ, before we had been born again to a lively hope through the re- resurrection of Jesus Christ, we were miserable. You think, well, I wasn't that miserable. Well, think about it. What did you have hope in? Your job? I hate my job. 75, 80% of people do. You know, or probably more than that. I can't wait till Friday, right? Can't wait. Everybody's living for what? The weekend, right? Where's your hope? In the weekend? Where's your trust? Where's your faith? In the government? Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, where's your hope? Where is your trust if it is not in Christ? So why are we miserable, Paul? Uh, the scriptures tell us, Paul gives us an answer in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12. In that verse, he's writing about people who had been separated from Christ. They were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, from the commonwealth of the church of Jesus Christ. They were strangers to the promise. In other words, they did not know Christ. They hadn't been saved by grace through faith. And because of that, Paul says, they have no hope that they are without God in this world. Have you ever been to the funeral of somebody who did not know Jesus Christ? That is hopeless. How can we know God? In other words, apart from Christ, Apart from the resurrection, there is no hope. There are only maybes. There are only mites. And if someone doesn't have hope, they're miserable. And if there is no hope beyond this life, if there is no resurrection, Paul is saying, why bother? Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow, you know what, you might die. That's basically what Paul is saying. And we see this philosophy, this way of thinking, this worldview lived out all around us and it's shoved down our throat. And the worldview is this, that we're a product of time and chance. Time and chance. In other words, we just happen to be here because at the right time, at the right place, the exact mixture of, I don't know, proteins, amino acids, and, and, and chemicals and enzymes, they all came together and they formed this primordial ooze. And then when those chemicals were exactly right and at the exact right temperature, a bolt of lightning struck that pile or pool of ooze and it gave it the power necessary to jumpstart life. In other words, you know, oh, it's ready now, charge it to 300 joules, and boom, hit it with a defibrillator, and it jump starts. Okay? There it is. At that moment, life began. That's what science teaches us. And at that moment, the evolutionary chain began, and that's why we're here this morning. That's what it says. This is what is being taught. This is what it's being accepted as truth, and it's taught in the schools, it's in the books we read, it's on the evening news, it's in the movies you watch, it's on the television programs, it's everywhere, and we're taught that we're just bone dumb stupid if we don't believe this. How can you believe in the Bible? How can you believe those things? How can you believe that a bolt of lightning struck a pool of ooze and created all this? Takes more faith for that. And, but if you believe that we're a product of time and a product of chance, and, and what's going to happen? One day you're going to die. They're going to put you in the ground, and the cycle will start all over again, and somebody else will have life while you're dead. Because you know what? It's survival of the fittest. And one day you're going to grow old, and you're not going to be as fit as you are right now. And someone or something, you're going to die, and the more fit... We'll go on. And that's it. That's it. If this life is all there is, what purpose is it? What reason do you have to be here? Why even bother with morals? What difference does anything make? With this sort of thinking, with this sort of uh, worldview being shoved at us from every angle, is it any wonder that depression Is that an all-time high that you can go buy medication after medication after medication for that? Should we be shocked that young people turn to drugs and alcohol and live immoral lives and cook meth and who cares? 
Why bother? Is it any wonder that suicide rates across the board are on an uptick? If this is all there is, what difference does it make? Friends, this world, uh, science or other world religions, whatever, whatever you would like to think of, think of or wherever your mind goes to, they do not offer a lively hope. They offer a deadly hope. A deadly hope. And it's a deadly hope because there's no hope at all in it. Well, there are other religions, people say. They're okay. Well, it's a deadly hope. Name me another religion that has a resurrection in it. Muhammad's dead. Joseph Smith is dead. All the founders are dead. And there's no grace in them because you have to do A, B, C, and D. And if you falter on A, B, C, or D, then you go back down to the rung. You know, you might come back as a mosquito or something and you get swatted and then you've got to start all over again. And then it's just one thing after another. You're, you're on a works-based path that leads to heaven if you do everything right. Do you know anybody that does everything right? I don't. Thanks be to God for grace. For a grace that sent his son to exiles wallowing in the muck and the mire of their sin. And then he pulled us out of that muck and mire and he blessed us with a living hope, a lively hope that is founded upon the rock-solid truth of the resurrection of Christ from the dead. And I'm not going to go into all the proofs for the resurrection from the dead this morning, but it's a hope that is sure, a hope that is steadfast, a hope that is an anchor for your soul. And I need an anchor. Do you need one? Amen. I need an anchor. And this anchor goes behind the very veil of heaven where Christ has gone. This lively hope, this sure and steadfast anchor. And I like the way the message uh, paraphrases it. It says that it goes, this anchor goes into the very presence of God. That's where our hope is, is in the very presence of God. This lively hope that we've been born again into is what brings us in other words, it brings us into heaven itself. It leads us, as Peter tells us in verse 4, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and that will not fade away, that is reserved in heaven for you. I want to ask you, have you made your reservation? You ever been to a restaurant where you made a reservation and it was canceled? Somehow and you get there, well, I got reservations. No, you don't. That's not going to happen if you placed your faith in Christ, because it tells us here that it is imperishable, undefiled, will not fade away. When someone is born again, that birth, or should I, I guess I should say rebirth, means that they have become a child of God. It means that they have been adopted by God the Father through the shed blood of His Son, Jesus Christ, and have been brought before Him through the power of the Holy Spirit, that's how they have been adopted into the kingdom. And with all of this talk in regard to family, Paul, or Peter, naturally speaks of heaven as an inheritance. It's an inheritance that we receive. You know, we think of an inheritance this way. Well, Aunt Sally or Uncle John, he died, and you know what? He left me uh, $20,000. Woohoo! In other words, we think of it as an inheritance as something, uh, a serendipity of sort. Sort, something lucky that happens to us. Peter's talking about something different. Different. He's talking about an inheritance that is not received in this world. He's talking about an inheritance, an inheritance that belongs to each person that has been born again to this lively hope. It's an inheritance that first belonged to Jesus Christ, the one and only Son of God. And if you've been reborn, if you've been adopted into the family of God, then you become an heir with God and a joint heir with His Son, Jesus Christ. And whatever inheritance God the Father reserved for God the Son, He shares with everyone who has been adopted into the kingdom through His Son. That's what it is. And Peter tells us that this inheritance is incorruptible, undefiled, and unfading. Now, that's a great inheritance. I mean, uncorruptible means it can't be destroyed. You make an investment down here, make it in the stock market, you're taking a risk, right? The investment might fail. It might be lost forever. There's no such risk with this investment. 
with this heavenly inheritance. It's incorruptible, which means that not only that it will not be corrupted, it means that it cannot be corrupted. It cannot be. This inheritance is undefiled. In other words, it's not dirty money. It hasn't been set aside as a result of a, some sort of shady activity. It's been won through the perfect purity of God and his son. And it's protected by God in heaven, and nothing can ever spoil it. It's undefiled, and it cannot be defiled. That's what that means. And it does not fade away. Ladies love to get flowers. And a week later, what do you got to do with them? They fade, they die, and they're in the garbage, right? How many people have been on a cell call, and what happens to the call? The signal fades, and it's what? Gone. You see that message, call dropped, right? That's what happens. That doesn't apply to this. It's not going to wilt. It's not going to fade. God's not going to drop the call. The Phillips translation says that it's beyond the reach of spoil and decay. This heavenly inheritance that is reserved for us, who are those who are kept by the power of God for us through a salvation or through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. Okay, now I'm not a Greek scholar, but I know that there's a play on the words going on here in the Greek in verses 4 and 5. And if you have the King James Version, you can look at it if you want to. And if you don't have it, I'm pretty sure it's in the rack in front of you in verses 4 and 5. And there's a play on the Greek words here in these verses. If you look there, for the, at the end of verse 4 you, in the KJV, you find the word reserved. And at the beginning of verse 5, you have the word kept. And it says, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God. Well, the words translated as reserved and as kept, they're synonyms. Synonyms. Different words, same meaning. Huh. God's letting us know that the same power that keeps the inheritance reserved for us is the same power that keeps us reserved for the inheritance. It's God from beginning to end. It's not you, it's not me. Heaven is kept by the power of God, and you are kept by the power of God. Amen. You are guarded by the power of God. It, the, the guarding there has a military connotation to it. And it's the same power that causes us, or has, has caused us, to be born to this lively hope. That, and it's the same power that raised Christ from the dead. It's the same power that created the entire universe. It's the same power power that's still at work and is able to bring salvation and purpose and meaning to your life by the way of a lively hope that is only possible by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's where our hope is. That's where our power is. It's a glorious promise. It's a mighty promise. It's a glorious, we have a glorious, mighty, gracious, merciful God. That's what all of this is saying. A God that would give his one and only son to die a cruel death on Calvary. To what? To save wretched sinners wallowing in their muck and their mire so that we might have a sure and steadfast hope, a lively hope. He died to give that hope to sinners like you and me. Do you know that hope? Do you know that hope? Not do you know the church membership? And that's always a struggle for me because Jesus Christ died for the church and then to stand up here and throw off on the church by saying, do you know it through church membership? Well, if we understand church membership properly, we wouldn't even say that. Church membership means that you have actually placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Amen. It's not that you've stood up here and answered some questions from the preacher. It's faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Do you know him? Do you know that hope of the resurrection, that lively, living hope? You can know him today. Will you come to God the Father through the sacrifice of God the Son being drawn by God the Holy Spirit? He is the only one who can save you. I cannot. As I say that, I think about, I think about the fellow that's been cutting a lot of trees on Ken's property, 
and he's cut one tree on my property this past week. And I was talking to him, and he said, David Craig saved me seven or eight years ago. And me being a preacher and all that stuff, I thought, you better not hope, you better hope. And I know that David Craig would say, I didn't save anybody. I know he would, he would say that. But what he meant was, Christ saved me. And that David Craig helped me come to Christ. That's what he meant. Do you know Christ? Like that guy knows him? I don't know about his hours. <laughs> he keeps some strange hours. But anyway, that's another conversation. But do you know that Christ that can reserve a place in an undefiled, imperishable heaven that, can gives, you, that gives you hope, a living hope, a sure hope in this world that will pass away. Do you know him? And if you don't, you can know him now. Gracious God, we thank you, we praise you, and we give you all of the glory, all of the honor, for you alone are worthy of it. Lord, you have given us a living hope, a lively hope through the resurrection of your son from the dead. You have given us a, a reservation in heaven, and it is for us who are kept by your power. Lord, help us to remember that, that we are kept by your power, not our own, that we might stumble and that we might fall, but that you keep us with your power. Lord, help us to confess our sin and experience that forgiveness through the power of your Son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.